Good morning. You know, I, um, I come this morning just to open our worship in prayer, and a lot of times we, we come up here and we, or I come up here, or Kenny does, or, or any one of you, and we bring our concerns and our issues before God, but we also want to bring our praises and thank Him, and we thank, thank God this morning that uh, Miss Jane is back with us, and uh, uh, <clears throat> Even though she brought crossing with her, we'll overlook that. Um, any other praises that you'd like to share this morning? Yes. Great news, great news. Great news, great news. Um, yes, ma'am. That's awesome, awesome. And I know the camera and the, this doesn't play well to, to a recording. Uh, so those of you that are watching online, um, we're just lifting up praises. And Thank you. Um, I'm going to share a little bit uh, in, a, in a little while about uh, experience I had this week. And it's a prayer concern, but it's also a praise because I'm continually blown away by the faithfulness and the generosity of this uh, church family. And I am honored to be a part of it. So, so as we begin this morning, let's, let's go to God in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, um, as we begin this morning, we are reminded that in all seasons of our lives, you, we find you in the midst of it. In every event, we find you. When we are joyful, when we are fearful, when we are afraid, you are there and you comfort us. And your presence is something, Father, that we know that we can trust. And for that, we are so grateful. Father, in that gratitude, we turn to you today in prayer. For you know everything that we carry in our hearts, even things that there are those here this morning that are not willing to admit or offer up on their own. So Father, help us to, to turn over to you all those things that burden us and help us to find your peace. And Father, when we feel the need to, to carry the weight on our shoulders, help us to rely on you. When we're feeling alone or isolated, help us to experience your presence. For you are the great comforter. And so we pray this day, not only for ourselves, but for our neighbors. We pray for those who are afraid or uncertain. We pray for those who are sick or awaiting test results. And we also lift up this community and our world leaders that every decision they make will care for the least. And Father, I offer up a prayer for this church that we will continue to be a community together even when we are distant. And we pray for ourselves here that we will find strength and courage in the days and the weeks to come. Father, there is nothing that can separate us from you. Help us to always remember that. And we pray all of this and so much more in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Yeah. 
So how many uh, grandparents do we have in the congregation today? If you're a grandparent, raise your hand. Now, I've been told today's Grandparents Day. So if you're, if you're a grandparent, I uh, just uh, wish you a happy Grandparents Day today. Our first hymn this morning is Be Strong in the Lord. Be strong in the Lord and be of good courage. Your mighty defender is always the same. Mount up with wings as the eagle ascending. Victory is yours when you call on his name. Be strong, be strong, be strong in the Lord and be of good courage for he is your guide. Be strong, be strong, be strong in the Lord and rejoice for the victory is yours. Be strong in the Lord and be of courage your mighty commander will vanquish the foe fear not the battle for the victory is always his he will protect you wherever you go be strong be strong be strong in the Lord and be of good courage for he is your guide be strong be strong be strong in the lord and rejoice for the victory is yours and now trust and obey <coughs> When we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he sheds on our way. Let us do his good will, he abides with us still, and with all who will trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no in Jesus but to trust and obey not a burden we bear not a sorrow we share but at all he doth richly repay not a grief or a loss not a frown or a cross but is blessed if we trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. Thank you. Forgive me, but I totally forgot to remind you that uh, we should be remembering Andra and her family, Kenny, and their kids in our prayers. Um, Andra's mother went to be with the Lord on Friday morning, and uh, speaking with Kenny, it was a uh, wonderful experience. They were all gathered around her bedside, singing with her, uh, praying with her, and uh, he said it was a very calming experience. Um, I also wanted to share with you before I read the scripture this morning and why I'm so honored to be standing here representing you is I spent some time with a family that this church has been helping unbeknownst to a lot of you for over a year. And, you know, 2020 has been rather difficult for a lot of people. 
With this family, 2018 was difficult, 2019 was very difficult, and 2020 has just put them on the edge, going over the top. And uh, I went and spent some time with this lady and her three kids, and uh, this church is, she is so um, thankful and honored to, to uh, receive the help that we uh, are, are giving her. And, uh, you know, I just wanted to share that with you, that, um, that you guys don't see some of the things, and I wish you could see some of the things that, that because of your generosity, uh, you are helping a family uh, in great need survive day in and day out, you know. And I, um, Kenny called me Wednesday and shared the news that he would be traveling to Nashville and not here, and could I stand in for him? And he offered me Habakkuk, and I said, I think I'll leave that for you. Um, so he's gonna continue that when he comes back. And I've been praying about a lot about the message I wanted to bring to you today. And, you know, I, I start off with, what should we be reminded of? What promise of faith of God can I share with you? that would sustain you for the week and for the coming days ahead. Uh, because, you know, like this family that, that I sat with on Wednesday night, there's a lot of anxiety and fear um, abounds today. And I don't, you know, I sat there with her and listened and I don't have the answers to give her sometimes. Um, but the Psalms are a wonderful spot to go to for me. Um, and so that's what I wanted to share with you today in our scripture time, because I'm going to actually preach out of the book of Job. Um, the book of Psalms, um, you really find every human emotion in the book of Psalms. You find fear, praise, you find grief, sadness, outrage. Every emotion in hum uh, with human experience is written about in the book of Psalm, Psalms. And, you know, some of the psalms are filled with extraordinary praise to God. And like the Psalm 71 that I want to read to you today, um, it's reminding us ourselves of God's presence in our lives. So I want to read to you from the book of Psalms. And if you want to turn in your Bibles to Psalm 71, I'm going to read 1 through 6. Psalm 71 one through six. And as you're able, will you please stand in the reading of God's word. In you, O Lord, I take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your righteousness, deliver me and rescue me. Incline your ear to me and save me. Be to me a rock of refuge, a strong fortress to save me. For you are my rock and my fortress. Rescue me, O God, from the hand of the wicked, from the grasp of the unjust and cruel. For you, O Lord, are my hope, my trust, O Lord, from my youth. Upon me I have learned, I leaned, upon you I have leaned from my birth. It was you who took me from my mother's womb and my praise is continually on you. May God bless the reading of his word this morning. As we continue this morning, our next hymn is In Christ Alone My Hope is Found. Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my life, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, <coughs> this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still. When striving cease, my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. 
No guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ I stand. Thank you. Oh, I love that hymn. That's one of my favorites. Our last hymn this morning is Have Faith in God. lonely. He sees and knows all the way you have trod. Never alone are the least of his children. Have faith in God. Have faith in God. Have faith in God. He's on his throne. Have faith in God. He watches o'er his own. He cannot fail, he must prevail. Have faith in God, have faith in God. Have faith in God in your pain and your sorrow. His heart is touched with your grief and despair. Cast all your cares and your burdens upon him. And leave them there, oh, leave them there. Have faith in God, he's on his throne. Have faith in God, he watches o'er his own. He cannot fail, he must prevail. Have faith in God, have faith in God. Sing this chorus with me. Only believe, only believe, all things are possible. Only believe, only believe, only believe, all only believe. Thank you. For the water, so my soul longeth after thee. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship thee. You alone are my strength, my shield. To you alone may my spirit yield. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship you. I want you more than gold or silver only you can satisfy. You alone are the real 
joy giver and the apple of my eye. You alone are my strength, my shield. To you alone may my spirit yield. You alone are my heart's desire and I long to worship you. Awesome, awesome, thank you. You know, he mentioned today being Grandparents' Day. Did y'all see Terry George back there dancing when he said that? Is anybody enjoying being a grandparent more than her? And I'm jealous, by the way, because I'm ready. So, how many of you, you raised your hand that you're a grandparent, how many of you I'll be careful how I say this, but how many of you like Elvis Presley? How many of you? There we go. Yes, thank you. All right. <clears throat> so, on January 15th, a lot of you probably know this, in 1971 in Memphis, Tennessee, the king of rock and roll was honored by the United States Junior Chamber of Commerce, better known as the JCs as one of the 10 outstanding young men of America. And past honorees of this award included John F. Kennedy, Robert Kennedy, John Kissinger, and Orson Welles. Future President George H.W. Bush actually spoke at this ceremony just before Elvis was presented his award. And I say all this just to show you that it was a pretty big honor even for Elvis Presley. And during Elvis's acceptance speech, he included these words, and they've, I actually have this on a plaque at my house. And it says, I would like to say that I have learned very early in life that without a song, the day would never end. Without a song, a man ain't got a friend. Without a song, the road would never bend without a song. So I keep singing a song. And so, you know, when I think about and I contemplate the depths of God's love for me, God's love for you, demonstrated in your salvation, it creates a song to sing. It creates a song in you. And when you think about what God has saved you from, it will produce another song for you to sing. And so if you brought your Bible with you, I'd like for you to turn to the book of Job. And I'd like for you to turn to chapter 42. We're going to start there and we're going to work our way backwards. We're not going to go all the way through each chapter, I promise you. You know, if you're from a church background, you know, last time I was here, I, I shared with you that I grew up in a Brethren church. But after the Brethren church, I ventured over to the Baptist church. And the Baptist church, and actually Roswell Street Baptist Church, many of you have probably have heard of it. You've heard of Nelson Price. Nelson, I gave my life to Christ um, and was baptized at Roswell Street Baptist Church. My brother and I actually were baptized on the same night. And then I visited the Catholic Church many a nights with a friend of mine. And I flipped over to the Methodist Church for a while, those of you that know me. But in between a lot of that, there was no church for me a great deal of the time. And so one of the most confusing to me and depressing books of the Bible was the book of Job. And if you're from an unchurched background or even if you're not a Christian, you're still probably aware of Job. Because you've probably heard the phrase, well, you're Job. Or, you know, when bad things happen to you, you're like, you must be a Job. And so there's this whole other thing going on in the book of Job. 
And I, 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 I felt this need, this desire, after I met with this family, to go back to the book of Job. And I get to chapter 42, and let me say this, and I'll say this as, as kindly as I can, but during a good portion of my early life, when I heard the book of Job taught or preached on, I thought it, when I look back, I think it was completely incorrect. It seems like when most people speak on the book of Job, they stop after chapter two. I had no idea for a better part of my life that there were 40 more chapters in the book of Job. And I get to chapter 42, verse 12. And when you read this verse, when I read this verse for the very first time, I literally stopped and I underlined it. And I'm very curious to see if you've heard it before and have read it the way I have read it. The Bible says this, the Lord blessed the latter part of Job's life more than the first. To me, that's the coolest thing I've ever heard. I read that and honestly, and I thought to myself, I want that. I want God to bless me like that. It's kind of like getting an overabundance of Joy Austin's coconut pies. And if you don't know that, then you haven't been blessed like I have. But do you know what else I focused on? I believe that God wants to bless each and every one of us even more than we think he wants us to be blessed. That's one thing that I know. I don't know every one of you super well, but I know in my heart that each one of you wants to be blessed. And I want to ask you something, and you've got to be honest because you're in church, right? Right? How many of you, you we've, we're answering questions today, okay? How many of you have ever been mad? How many of you have ever been mad? And if you're not raising your hand, you're lying in church. How many of you have ever been confused? All the married men's hands went up, right? <clears throat> Why do women need 18 bottles of shampoo and conditioner and body wash and whatever else in the shower? Sorry. How many of you have ever been frustrated? I mean, absolutely frustrated. All the parents' hands went up, right? Because if you're a parent, your child will take away every, your ability to speak in complete sentences sometimes. We've all been mad. We've all been confused. We've all been frustrated. Now let me ask you another question, but don't raise your hand this time, because many of you won't be truthful anyways. How many of you have ever been mad, confused, and or frustrated with God? You see, we don't talk about that in church very much. A lot of times we go to church and we're not real and we don't show our emotions. But there are people in this room today, and there's people watching us from their homes. And let's be honest, you're mad at God. You're frustrated. And some of you are sitting here saying, well, you should never be mad at God. I've been mad at God before. In all honesty, I've literally been very upset with God. I've literally looked to the sky and said, this stinks, God. Why? Some of you have been very frustrated with God. Have you ever looked at God, and come on, be honest, and said, come on, God. Why now? We get confused, right? I know we get confused because the Bible says we do. In Isaiah 55, it says, My ways are not your ways, and my thoughts are not your thoughts. In other times, he says, there will be times when we get confused. And it, what, it, what I was told a large portion of my early life in church is that we should never express anger. We should never express frustration. And we should never express our confusion. But do you know what that does to people? 
It makes them feel small and inadequate. Let's just come to church, show up, be fake, and go home. Now, I don't think that's the way God has set it up for us. When we get frustrated or confused, when we get angry, what do we want to do every time? We want to give up, right? I, I remember math in high school and being extremely frustrated and confused and throwing my pencil against the wall or throwing my book on the ground. I wanted to give up. I argue sometimes that God allowed Satan to create two things, mosquitoes and math. And I can probably throw in clowns too. I would get so frustrated with math and say, I'm done with this. When we get mad, when we get frustrated, when we get confused, our temptation is to always give up. We want to throw in the towel. And so if you want to be blessed, I'm going to give you a secret in one sentence. Don't ever give up on the God who's never going to give up on you. If you want to be blessed, don't ever give up on a God who's never going to give up on you. There might be someone here today that says, you know what, Kim? I believe God has given up on me. There are people in our community that believe that. But we are told throughout the Bible that, that we should always look to God. Galatians 6, 9 says, Let us not grow tired of doing what is good at just the right time. We will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. You know, life is hard, right? We've all heard this statement. We've all lived that. Life is hard. I hear kids and adults alike say, my life is hard. And I know life is hard because we live in a fallen world. None of us in this room actually plan a hard life. Nobody in this room, have you ever scheduled a tragedy in your life? Oh man, we got to get a car wreck in here this week, okay? We need to get a car wreck, and can you do it on Monday or Tuesday about 4 p.m.? What about a broken leg? Can you throw a broken leg in there? I don't think Miss Jane scheduled that, right? That never happens to us. We don't see bad times coming. I learned that in all places, Disney World, that we don't see bad times coming. I hope I never go back to Disney World. <laughs> People say, well, did you have a good time? <laughs> no. <laughs> Parents don't go to Disney World to have a good time. You go to Disney World for your kids to have a good time. Disney advertises happiness, right? But the commercials should advertise crazy. You know, they, you see these advertisements of Mickey standing on Main Street, USA, and there's a family of four standing right beside him. And there's nobody else there. <laughs> Where's the other 100,000 people? And it doesn't look like it's 132 degrees. And they don't tell you it costs $100 per minute to talk to Mickey. I'm sorry, I'm getting off saying. <laughs> It was awful. You would expect a good time at Disney World. But not even Disney World can deliver ultimate happiness. You know, if you go to Job chapter 1 and 2, and we're not going to do that today, but I, I would challenge you to read that before you go to bed tonight. You can read both chapters in 10 minutes. It's a fascinating story. And it says in Job chapter 1 that Job was blameless and upright. Those are two very powerful words. I don't know of too many men that I would describe in that way, and least of all myself. And the Bible says that Job was a godly man. He was wealthy, and he loved his family. And he obviously loved his wife. He had ten kids, right? Seven sons and three daughters. He loved his family in the way that he loved his God. In that day and age, Job was extremely blessed by God. 
But during this time, God and Satan were having a conversation. And as a side note, I want you to know there's something that I've learned. There's always more going on in your life than you can always see. Always. God and Satan are having a conversation, and God says to Satan, have you considered my servant here, Job? He's blameless and upright. And Satan says to him, well, of course he is. He's, he's blessed. You've blessed him. Because Satan knows any fool can come and be blameless and upright as long as they're blessed, right? Anyone can come in here and raise their hands and worship when life is great. And Satan says this, take away his blessings and he'll curse you. And so God tells Satan, all right, we'll, we'll take away his blessings. Another side note. Satan had to get permission from God. Make no mistake about it, God has no equal. And so we know that Job had a day that would live in infamy, right? He had one of the worst days of all time. And one day he lost all of his material possessions, went bankrupt, he lost every possession he owned. And in that same day a disaster took place and he lost all 10 of his children. Can you imagine the pain? My kids get their feelings hurt and I'm crushed. I can't imagine the pain. But at the end of chapter 1, Job says this, Naked I came into this world, and naked I will leave. The Lord giveth, and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Wow. But it doesn't end there, right? Because in chapter 2, God and Satan start having another conversation. And if I'm Job at that point, I'm like, we y'all two, please quit getting together. God asked Satan again, have you noticed my servant? Job, you took everything for him, everything, and yet he still follows and loves me. But Satan says this, he says he still has his health. You take away his health and he'll curse you. And God says to him, you can do anything you want, but you cannot kill him. So Job goes to the doctor, right? And the doctor runs all these tests and tells Job, you have every disease known to man. The worst being boils. Can you imagine? Job is so bad in chapter 2 that his three friends visit him and he couldn't speak for seven days. They were bewildered at how sick he was. Even his own wife says to him, would you just curse God and die? And at this point, if you have a long church history, you've heard this before. I've actually heard preachers say this. They get to the point of the story of Job at this point, and you, they say, Job had a hard life. Nobody in here has had a life like Job. And so basically, suck it up. Let's pray. Have you ever heard that message before? Because I have. And I'm not going there today because the pain that you're going through is real. And I'm not going to be the guy that tries to outpain your pain. Have you ever met that guy? The person who no matter how bad your story is, they have a story that's worse. If you've never met that person, you might be that person. <laughs> That kind of person is miserable to be around, right? You, you could walk into work tomorrow with a bandage on your hand because you cut your finger tonight and have to have seven stitches. And you go into work and that guy comes up and says, hey, what's wrong with your finger? And you explain to him what happened and the stitches that you got and tell him how hard it hurt. And they say, that's not pain. I'll tell you about pain. And they go into this long story about how they were in the Amazon carrying books of Bibles and they got overtaken by um, you know, a tribe of whatever and you know blah 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 you know fire eating ants took off his leg and you know you know you ever met that guy 
I probably shouldn't say it in church, but it's okay to smack that guy. <laughs> what I'm trying to say is I can't define pain for anyone else. But here's what's amazing. You don't need me to define your pain. You already know what hurts. Because there are people in this room that are feeling emotional pain. And it hurts. And I'm not going to stand on the pulpit and tell you to get over it. I'm not, I'll stand here and tell you that your pain is real. Emotional pain is very, very real. Because life is hard. You know, Job dealt with financial pain. He lost everything, and there are many people, not only here, but in our communities, that are dealing with financial pain in the past year. Financial pain is very real. Relational pain of losing people that you love, that you've been in relationships with, are very real. And physical pain, Job experienced physical pain like no other. How many of you like physical pain? You know, it's amazing to me the amount of people that I've heard recently that have been completely healthy one week and completely unhealthy the following week. Be honest, pain, all these types of pain equal anger, confusion, and frustration. But there's one more pain, and that's spiritual pain. In Job's culture, and even in our own, unfortunately, here's what's crazy. There's, there was a false idea at that time that still exists today, that God does good things to good people and bad things to bad people. And if you're good and you dot all, the I's and cross all the T's that God will bless you. And if you're bad, well, God's going to make you have a car wreck and your kids go crazy and your marriage fall apart. Good things happen to good people and bad things happen to bad people is the thought. And it's actually an idea that is rooted in Hinduism. They call it karma. Unfortunately, it's made its way into the church sometimes. We look at ourselves when we're going through bad times and say to ourselves, well, God must hate me because good things happen to good people, right? And bad things happen to bad people. But the only problem with that theory is Jesus. We try to reduce Christianity to this simple little formula and so many of the sayings that we have and the bumper stickers that you see that say stuff like, God is my co-pilot. I'm sorry if you have that on your car today, but I think that's dumb. God is your pilot. But the all-time worst one to me is this saying, the safest place to be is in the will of God. Well, then what do you do with Jesus Christ? who, by the way, was in the will of God and crucified on a cross. Now, don't get me wrong. God's will is right. God's will is ultimately good. But God's will is anything but safe. I've heard pre preachers literally say that Job was a righteous man because he never questioned and never doubted God. Nope. That means you stopped reading at chapter 2. Because when you start reading in chapter 3 through 37, Job's got problems. In fact, Job says, hey, God, if you show up and come down here, I'm going to straighten this mess out. In chapter 38, God did just that. He showed up. And you know what he told Job? Brace yourself like a man. You know what that verse says to me? Put your heart hat on, Job. We're fixing to go for it. Job had frustrations. Job had doubts. Job had questions. He was angry. You know, and I remember that Jesus Christ said, John the Baptist was the greatest man that ever lived. And you know what's funny to me about that? Do you know when he said that to him? 
right after John the Baptist sent someone to question Jesus about whether he was the one that was truly coming or should we expect someone else. You see, we've been told that people of faith don't have questions. They don't have doubts. They don't have frustrations. But the reality is when you read the Bible, the people that God uses the most are the ones that have the greatest doubts, the greatest frustrations, and the greatest questions. Job says this in chapter 19, I don't think I have this kind of, I don't think I have this kind of faith to say this. But Job says this in 19 verse 25. After all that he had gone through, he says this, I know my redeemer lives. This man who's lost his children, his fortune, his health. He says, "I I understand, but my God is alive." And I know he lives. Because God is silent in your life doesn't mean he's absent from your life. And Job said, and in the end, he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh, I will see God. I myself will see God with my own heart, my own eyes, and my heart yearns for thee. Job says, I don't understand it, I'm confused, I'm frustrated, I'm doubting, I'm angry, but here's the one thing that I know. One day I will see him and everything will be made right. I know he is living and I know he is alive and I have hope in him. 2,000 years ago, Jesus walked out of a tomb and as long as that tomb is empty, You and I, if we are in Christ, we have hope. No matter what is happening in our lives, because our hope is not based on our circumstances, our hope is based on the fact that God is God and God is good. And no matter what, we can walk in victory because the tomb is empty. And if you're going through a tough time and you belong to Jesus, God is working out the good in your life. Let me ask you something. How do you think Job felt at the end of chapter 2? At the end of chapter 2, Job was probably like, this is horrible. My life is terrible. Job was wrestling with everything in his life. At the end of chapter 2, Job probably felt that his life was almost over. But we can stand back and look at the book of Job and have comfort, right? Because we have read chapter 42. But while Job was in chapter 2, we've read 42. We know how the story ends. Job couldn't see this because he was in the middle of it. And I believe this with all my heart. If you belong to Jesus and you're going through a tough time, and you feel completely overwhelmed, and you're angry and confused and frustrated, you're just in chapter 2. 42 is coming. Because when you're in chapter 2, you can get frustrated, you can get angry, and you can be confused. And you want to give up, and you want to throw in the towel, but we have a God that's in all chapters of our lives. And the Bible says he blessed the second half of Job's life more than he blessed the first. You know, some people may push back and say, you know, Kim, I, I, I just don't see how God can use my circumstances for the good. And some of you could tell me your story, and I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't know how either. I wouldn't know what to say. But here's what I know. He turned a bloodstained cross into an empty tomb. And anybody that can do that can turn a bloodstained cross into an empty tomb. I believe he can turn my crucifixion into a resurrection. You know, we say at Easter that Friday's here, but Sunday's on the way. The reason that we can have hope for tomorrow is that he's been there and he reigns over it, so don't give up. And I know that sounds simple. 
And I'll close with this. There was a time in my life as a young adult that I was nowhere near where I needed to be in my walk with Christ. I had many questions, many frustrations, many doubts with God. And that Christmas, my brother Todd gave me a study Bible. And in the front of the Bible, he wrote these words. Join me in reading and studying God's word this year. And then he wrote this verse, and this verse has become my life verse, Zephaniah 317. The Lord your God is with you, a strong warrior to save you, happy to have you back. He'll calm you with a song. And Todd wrote in the bottom of the, the front page, he said, Kim, I believe God through you has a great song to sing. And I believe that for each and every one of us. That no matter what we're going through, that God has a song for us to sing. So let's keep singing a song. Let us pray. As Pam plays this morning and as we meditate on this scripture this morning, let us think about the, the culture that we live in where a lot of people are hurting. And what people need sometimes is not a program or even answers to questions. What they need and what we need is a relationship with God through our faith in Jesus Christ. And ultimately, the only thing that will stain any of us in the midst of our trials is our faith in Jesus Christ. So as we close this morning in prayer, I'm going to encourage you to pray about two things. If you're going through your own personal trial of some kind, ask God to deepen your relationship with him. Tell God that you no longer want to seek answers, but you want to just simply seek Him. And if you know of someone else that may be going through a trial, will you pray for that person? Even if it's appropriate for you to ask God to remove that trial, also pray for God to deepen that person's relationship with Him through the trial. Father God, I just thank you for the opportunity to share your word this morning. And Father, I pray that each and every one of us take your word and it make a deep meaning in our lives so that we leave here changed, that we leave here a resurrected people to share your love to those that need it most in our community. Father, we give thanks for your son, Jesus Christ, who makes all things possible. In your heavenly name we pray, amen.